Well, good morning. For those who online, the sick, the sick, lame, and lazy, good morning to you. But I, um, as Carl was saying, this this message actually is goes back uh, a couple of years. What sparked it off was an incident that took place in the church. Um, and it never left me. And I kind of thought to myself, what I saw inside of the church by a member, I thought to myself, is that the feeling in the church? If it was, we're in trouble. But I thought maybe it's just one person. But anyway, I looked into it and I thought, perhaps it's for all of us. And I hope this morning as I share with you what's been laid on my heart, that you receive it um, as a warning or receive it for a change in heart on your behalf. So, let us get started. It's, um, how am I doing? Already two minutes. Come on. <laughs> anyway, the title of the message is, How Am I Doing? You know, we, we meet somebody and say, how are you? He says, I'm fine. Even Christian, how, how are you doing? I'm fine. But what is going on inside? What is, what is really, really going on? So the question this morning I'm asking you is, how am I doing? Seems innocuous, but it's, it's loaded. I can tell you right now. From time to time, as if you're not well or as you get older, you are advised to visit the doctor at least once a year for a checkup. And um, I've been doing checkups for a while now, and <clears throat> praise the Lord, that's been going well. But why do we go for checkups? It's not something that you suddenly feel one morning and think, gee, I'll be go. But it's just been advised to do it. Good thing. So when you get to the doctor, they take blood, they take other liquids and things, and that gets sent off. You don't know where, but off it goes. And uh, two, three days later, you get a call to say, come and see your results. And sure enough, it's all there to say that you've been clear of this, you're clear of that, and hopefully you're clear of all things. But in the midst of all that, there's a something might be lurking that you're not sure of. You're not, you don't see it, you don't feel it, but it can only be picked up when somebody looks at it through a microscope or whatever they use in these labs. Then they can detect that there's something not right. Then the doctor can look at it in advance and avoid a catastrophe or a disaster later on. So my question is, we being spirit beings, what about our spirit? What about our 
spiritual walk? Does it need a checkup? Do we, do we need those checkups? So I thought, well, I had a good look at, well, I've been looking at the Bible now for 50 years, so it came to me that, yes, as spiritual people, we need checkups every now and then. It's in the Word, as you're going to find out. And um, a spiritual checkup is, is a lot like uh, the physical one. You've got to look deep down into what, what, how you are from inside. And uh, the spiritual checkup will also reveal any unwelcome guests. It, you know, we, 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 we think, uh, well, like, all's going well, but there are, we're at war. If, once you said to Jesus, I'm your child, you're at war. And the devil will come to rob, kill, and destroy. And I want to pray this morning that, that this checkup will reveal anything that you need to deal with. Now, some of these conditions of the spiritual ailments, they're so subtle that even the person who has a problem, like in the physical, you don't know until somebody tells you. They are so subtly and so deceptive. So keep that in mind because you say, I'm okay, but let's see. So what does the word say about checkups? Okay, the first one is found in Philippians 2.12. In fact, this is a scripture that's been on my heart for so, so long. And um, it never left me. And uh, okay, there it says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I, I used to think that fear was bung, you know, but I still think it does anyway. <laughs> so work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But what is salvation? People think maybe it's just because I'm now saved. No, salvation is much, much, much more than that. In fact, salvation... Is it encompasses the whole kingdom of God. It's your commitment, it's your obedience, and it's your priorities. That makes up salvation. And, and um, Paul writes and says, check it out. Work it out. Work out your salvation continually. And I think we, we've got to understand that it's not a one-time thing, but it needs to be done continually. Because like me, I go for a checkup. First, I go once a year, but I do skip it every now and then. But it's continuously we going for checkups. Now, the spiritual ailments that, that can be found in your checkups. Some of them may not be because of what we're going to be talking about. They, they come about because of depression. That can cause an ailment in your spiritual checkup. Ill health. It's sad when people suffer from ill health because it can affect their walk with God. So that will also show up in your checkup. Rejection. Rejection is a terrible, terrible thing. You know, people suffer from it. If they reject it from a child for years to come, they'll suffer from it. And it's those types of things that, 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 that will come out. However, there's one condition that gets left, if left undetected, can prove catastrophic. It's the big C. And it's a word called complacency. Does it ring a bell? Complacency? Okay, that's what this morning's all about. Um, a great preacher, Jerry Savelle, always said that faith and hope are the, are the, are the, are the, are the good twins, or the power, are the power twins. But now I say the two C's are the terrible twins. Compromise, complacency. We're not going to do it. Compromise is another, for another day. But we're going to talk about complacency this morning. And I'm hoping that if you don't fall into that category, you'll be aware of it. If you do, we're going to, do, we're going to sort it out later on. What is complacency? The first word that came up was smug. Smug. S-U-M-G. Smug. I love it because it describes complacency. You smug. Like a bug in a rug, you know, you sort of feel as though <laughs> you're self-satisfied. That's the other thing about complacency, you're self-satisfied. You're calmly confident. How are you? Hey, the time lekker. Lekker very seer. Quietly confident. Or overconfident. Complacency can cause overconfidence. Now, 
For me to illustrate complacency, I'm going to relate a story, a true story, and it's going to involve sport. So it's fine. Paul often spoke about sport. So it's okay. Last year, you remember the, uh, uh, there was a cricket tournament in India, the World Cup. South Africa was there and a whole lot of other teams. And you play a sort of round robin and you get points and all this sort of thing. Anyway, South Africa were one of the favourites. They were regarded as one of the favourites. They started the tournament off so well. They beat, I think it was India, Australia. I know they beat Australia. That was nice. <laughs> and they beat, and they did so well. The next team on the list for them to play against was the ne Netherlands. Small, do you remember this incident? <laughs> Small little place up there below the sea level <laughs> where, where people stand with their fingers in the dike. But, you know, they played the Netherlands and they thought, oh, the minnows of cricket, we are the Goliaths. What happened? If you know the story? Anyway, the Netherlands went into, went into bat first and they made 400 and, was it? No, sorry, 200, 245 runs, I think it was. That is quite a good score against these boys. Then it's the South Africa's turn to bat. What did they make? 208, I think. They lose by, I don't know, written down here somewhere, about 48 runs. It was a shock of the tournament. In fact, it was the shock of the history of the tournament. How can this powerhouse of South Africa lose against the minnows of Netherlands? All due respects. And he was even a Panamera playing for them. <laughs> and his name was Rolof Panamera. <laughs> Someone asked me if his relative, I said, nah. But anyway, and so, yeah, they lost. Why did they lose? You could blame all sorts of things. But I can tell you now why they lost. They were complacent. They were like Netherlands. The water is like black. Yeah. Oh, we just have to pitch up. I don't know why we're even playing. Why don't they just give us three points? Let's move on. Ah. They got clubbed. Yeah, they did. So... My question to Christians is, can we become complacent? The answer is yes, we can. You know, when things are going smoothly, it's all calm, nice. basking in the warmth of God's grace, no faith needed, you're not getting involved, you're saved. Cruising Christian, I think Carl once mentioned the cruising Cruising Christian. You know, God doesn't reveal himself to the casual inquirer. Doesn't. He has the first warning shot. You know, they talk about a shot across the bowels. This is your first shot. On fast. 1 Corinthians 10 12. It says, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Oh. The problem with complacency is that if unchecked or if not rooted out, it leads to worldliness. What happens worldliness starts creeping in. Because you're no longer on guard. You're no longer at the edge. You're, you're no longer alert, as Peter says. So what happens is your old way, the one that you put to death, starts resurrecting itself. It starts coming into your life. And you start talking like the world. You start thinking like, you know, you, it, you really start becoming worldly. Without... Complacency, it brings about a self-reliancy. You self become self-reliant, you become self-confident, you become self-dependent, you become self-sufficient. Self, self, self. And more I, I, I. Now, where's Jesus in all this? And you slowly but surely become self-contained. Not a good place to be. Not a good place. I want to use a Bible illustration to, to illustrate complacency and the result thereof. The parable of the ten virgins. You all know this parable. 
But let's have a look at it from a, a different angle. Okay? The groom is coming. These ten maidens have been chosen to welcome the groom into the wedding banquet, to the reception, whatever. And they all dressed up. I don't, actually, I haven't looked into the, the ceremony of it, but I presume it's a some sort. They all dressed up beautifully, made up makeup and everything. And each one's got a lantern full of oil. So what happens? I don't know if it was a power cut, what, but anyway, there was lanterns. <laughs> so what happens is the groom comes and they all sh- shake the lanterns and go with them all the way to the... Such a great ceremony. So you were five who thought, I'm taking an extra kaneki with me. The other five didn't. So they all go, all of them went to, they all look the same, they all dressed the same, they went to the, to the place. You know the story? The groom was late in coming. Now, that, that is why it, things have changed slightly. The groom now sits in the church and the bride comes. <laughs> so make sure they're not late. They sit not far from mother-in-law. <laughs> anyway, the groom was late in coming. So what happens is, and you know, if you ever seen a paraffin lamp or an oil lamp, when it starts going out, it doesn't just go out. It, it kind of flickers, yeah. flickers, yeah. flickers. <laughs> More to it. Then... What happens is, the guys with the kaniki top up. And they say, but, you know, <laughs> that's your problem. So off they go, and pick and pay was a long way away. <laughs> off they go to fetch more oil. In the meantime, you know the story, the groom comes and the five welcome him in, and, and, and they go in and the door is closed. The other five arrive, they come back. Now, their lamps lit and trimmed, and they get there and the door is closed. Let us in. Let us in. Eventually, someone opens, uh, the groom opens the door and says, says, let us in. He says, you can't come in. I don't know you. I don't know you. So the reason why they weren't invited, or weren't allowed into the wedding banquet, not because they were late. Hey, listen, we've often arrived late at receptions. You can come in. It's not because they ran out of oil. The reason is because it lies in those four words, I don't know you. The most dreadful words I reckon you could, well, one of the most dreadful words you could experience in the Bible, I don't know you. But there were people from the church, they were there with the, all these things. It was just a little bit late, that's all. Just a little bit of oil. What happened? What happened? 1 Corinthians 8.3. Is that my, I don't know if that's one of my... Verses up there, not. Okay, 1 Corinthians 8.3 is this. But a man who loves God is known by God. Can I read that again? A man who loves God is known by God. So when I look at the end of that parable, I didn't know you, it tells me that at the beginning they didn't love God. It looked like it. I mean, they were dressed for the occasion. They had lamps. That, you know, be careful of complacency. They thought this is going to last if they'd loved God, they'd have taken more than enough. Because that's the kind of God we serve. Yes. More than enough. So that's another warning. Comes our way. My question is, do you feel a little bit cold in your walk of Christianity? Do you feel as though you've fallen away in any areas? that spark, that excitement, has it gone? Has it waned? Complacency brings in half-heartedness and it brings in a prayerlessness. Do you find yourself praying less? Sorry, maybe the, maybe the mood was from the very beginning. It's, it's something to think about. Take heart. There's hope. You can, affair, you can avoid the dreaded I don't know you judgment. Just hang in there. Listen in. Because if you leave now, you're not going to know. <laughs> so hang in there. But it requires an effort on your behalf. That's the person next to you and say, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. The Bible says, Test yourself. 
What? There's actually a test. A test that you actually undergo. Now, I wish my Bible had in the back a long list of pages of saying, with a little block next to it, it says, tick if it's correct, and then all these things. And you tick, 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 and say, oh, yeah, I'm okay. It doesn't do that. But it's all in there. It's all in You've got to read it. You can't just go there and let him. No, you've got to find out. And this is what it's all about. Test yourself and be brutally honest. Two Corinthians three five. Now um, that is NIV up there. I will tell you a little bit more just now. Examine yourselves. Nudge the guy next to you and say yourself. Examine yourselves and see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do not do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless of course you fail the test. Now he's not writing to. The club members at the, at the country club, he's writing to Christians at a church. He's saying, test yourself. Listen to what the, NIV, um, the Amplified says. It says, examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you are holding your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. <laughs> That's the guy say, hey, nah. <laughs> Okay, it doesn't stop. It says, test and prove yourselves, and in brackets, not Christ. Jesus doesn't need to be tested. He's done it all. He's, if, if, if the fault is anywhere, it's with you. And you need to find out where it is and do something about it, which we'll talk about in a minute. So it's quite clear that you should test yourself. Now, you might turn around and say, have you done that? I say, yeah, I can say to you, I have. In fact, that's what happened. I found out I come short in a lot of areas in my life. So, wow, what is the test? Look, it's nothing mystical. It's nothing strange and straightforward. Can I make a few suggestions just to put you you at ease and say to yourself, hang on, you know what, I can do this. Because if I throw it out to you and say, test yourself, and you walk out here and say, where do I begin? I'll give you a few suggestions. Number one, does my life reflect what God thinks of me? Does my tithing and offering line up with the word of God? Does my faith and deeds work together according to James? Do I display the fruit according to Galatians 5? Do I love according to 1 Corinthians 13? Am I involved in church affairs? Is my life fully consecrated to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And much, much, much more. It's all in here. So, 2 Peter 1.10. Therefore, you always ask what's the therefore, therefore. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, Make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. You, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. You cannot avoid it. Don't be deceived. Romans fourteen twelve says, So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. You know, imagine now it would have been so nice that the day you got saved, your day you were taken to heaven. It doesn't work that way. It may have, on the odd occasion, just somebody had to happen that way. But anyway, for most people, you, know, you have to live on earth. You've got to see your time through. That's God's plan, because he's got a plan for you. And you know what? God involves you. He hates... Does God hate... Me? He doesn't like working alone. He loves working with his people. That's, that's his nature. That's why he created us, so that we can work with him to look after his nature, to creation, and to tell people about the love of God. Okay, let's move on and see. There is a divine scale. And uh, it's found in Daniel 5. Belshazzar had a banquet. He was the king in, in um, 
not Babylonia, Babylon. And um, what had happened was they'd raided Israel, Jerusalem, plundered the Jerusalem some years before, and, 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 and stole everything out of the temple, all the gold uh, goblets and silver plates and, all, and, and took them all to Babylonia. And uh, that night, this king called for those stuff to come out and they filled them up with wine and they were having a hell of a party. Because that's what it was. And they were drinking and singing and everything, using these things that were used in the temple. God's anger must have just risen when he saw what they were doing. Before that, they had been stored away. That was the night that they used them. It was during that lacquer party where there was a, a, a blank wall at the, end of the, at the end of the hall, and suddenly there was quiet, and a hand. Can you imagine seeing this? The guys must have thought, Ooh, this wine is strong. <laughs> the, a hand appears and starts writing on the wall. Three words he writes. He wrote, have you got it there? Did I have it? I'll give it to you. Ah, okay, so he wrote three words. He wrote, mene, Tekel and Peres. But we're not interested in... We are interested in Tekel. Okay, have you got it up there? Do you have it for a moment? Okay. Tekel. To see what it says, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Divine scales of God. <laughs> when God saw this, they called, you see, nobody could interpret those three words. And they called Daniel. And Daniel, yeah, I know what they, God told him. You don't know what they are. The third one, the second one was this. And he spoke to the king. He says, you have been found, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Two verses later, he was dead. More to it. Gone. <laughs> Two verses later. It would appear that there is a divine scale. Let's have a look. He has a warning. Don't use any scale. Don't think that, oh, the divine scale is a bit harsh. I'll use another scale. Number one, if you use a bathroom scale, these are hypothetical, by the way. If you use a bathroom scale, it tells you what you weigh, not what you should weigh. No good. A fisherman's scale always overweighs. No good. But... You find, um, when you take the test, you'll be found wanting on God's scale, if, if, that, if that is the case. So what do I do? If I'm found wanting, if you took this test, and I'm hoping, I really, really hope that you, when you read your word, you'll look in there and see how you're doing. But if you're found wanting, what must I do? You can't just leave it. That time lapsed already. Um, I want, to, I want to suggest something. Now, when a, when, a, when a great sportsman is out of form and everything, sometimes the coach takes him to back to basics, and they find out that you know, these golfers, they must come and ask me, you know, you know hand you know, is not right. Just readjust. And I'm saying to you as Christians, sometimes go back to basics. You know what the basic basics are? Go back to Calvary. Yeah. Now, for a moment, I want you to imagine, use your imagination. Okay, God-given imagination, something that's been stolen away from us because of media and all these things. But use your imagination this morning, please. Just come with me. Let's go to Calvary. Let's take a slow walk to Calvary. It's a little bit of a hill. So we walk up this hill. We're going back to Calvary. I'm not for a moment suggesting we're crucifying Jesus again, please. That is not this. But we go there. When you arrive at the cross, just stop and look. And you're going to see a, a bruised and bleeding Jesus hanging on the cross. Now, it's a gloomy day because remember they said that the sun disappeared. And you stare at this and you see in the blood forgiveness. You see in the broken body healing. And you're inclined to look away because you don't want to see this, but don't. Look back. Look at it. Linger a bit longer. Stay there for a while. 
And then, having done that, you turn away and you walk away slowly down the hill now. Where are we going? We're going to the cemetery. We're going to where the tomb is. When you arrive there, you're still crying. Cry, it's fine. Cry, it's good. You arrive at the tomb. And through tearful eyes, you look carefully. And you look, there's a big gate. Oh, stone is rolled away. And God is saying, go inside. Go and have a look. Go and look inside. What do you see? There's bandages lying on that table. And it just comes up to you again. He's risen. Oh my God, he's risen. And you step back and those tears of remorse, those tears of, of, of seeing Jesus hanging like that on the cross just turn to joy. And you walk away from there and say, yes. He's risen. Let that experience reignite your, your life. Let that compromise, let that complacency, just, just see it moving away. It may happen this morning, it may happen next week, I don't know. Let your heart be broken. In the Psalms it tells us that God can only work with a broken heart, with a contrite heart. He can't work with a whole hardened heart. Once it's in pieces, God can put it together. And that's what he's looking for. He's looking for that heart to say, I've messed up. I've messed up, Lord. Put me together. Oh, that must be the most beautiful thing. With his hands just putting you together. Let Jesus take you out of that stagnant pool of mediocrity and place you where you belong, next to the stream of living water, where your leaf won't wither. You will bear fruit in season. You will, your leaf will for always be green. That's where you belong. Don't let the world steal your, your Christianity. It's precious. Hold fast to it. Amen. 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 Uh, God was saying earlier on, we family. And when I first thought to this, I thought, this might be a bit harsh. But you know what? I can say it because we're family. Here, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. If anybody <laughs> feels like they want to deal with it right now, then this is the time. Because sometimes when we leave here, other things catch our attention. And it becomes one of those things that was just put away. But Lord, I pray that if there is a broken heart this morning, Lord, that you would touch that person, reignite that love. Let that I don't know you go away far, far away. Oh, Jesus, you did it all for us. Let's not throw it away at this time. Let's hold fast to that love. Thank you, my Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Rolf. Suitably challenged, I'm sure we all have been. Um, walk out differently this morning. I think the whole thing of complacency is now leaving this place and doing nothing about it. Know that what God has deposited in your heart is not now to be forgotten. I think spend time with us. Spend time and just say, God, what are those ways? I mean, we'll, I'll get some of these things from Rolf just to put out during the week of just some of those reflection points, not as a, a checklist, but there's often that oil that you can reflect on. There's often the fruits of the Spirit. And you can just say, God, what's happening there? And He can show you and spend some time there that you shift that place of complacency from your life. Rolf, thank you very much. Um, I'm so pleased to have received this word myself. I know there's space in my life where I've got some work to do. So I think we've all been challenged. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, can I please ask? Thank you. Can we just? Hey. Yeah.